All right, welcome to The Answer, where we ask and answer the biggest questions in the NBA. I'm Wes Goldberg, and this week I am joined by Anthony Irwin, who does the best job covering the Lakers and knowing how Lakers fans feel better than anybody that I know. Anthony, thanks so much for joining me this week. That's the nicest thing anybody has said about my Lakers coverage. I appreciate that. I want to go in a lot of different directions with you, um, but we got to start with Rui Hachimura. I have long been sort of on my own on the Rui Hachimura Island, just sort of waiting for people to join me because he was yeah. playing with the Washington Wizards. Nobody really cared to make that, <laughs> that trip, but now yeah. that he's playing for the Lakers and we know how Lakers fans can be. It, you're like, All right. Yeah. Well, what's this Island? Like, what do you got? Some bananas and coconuts over here. It's nice. Yeah. Uh, some trees. I love Rui Hachimura. I know he's been underwhelming. I get it. I like the upside. What, what were your thoughts on the Rui deal? It was surprising in the moment, but then the more that you kind of think about it, not all that surprising. Rob Polinka believes in pedigree above all else. Uh, you know, he, you look at his moves and he'll kind of overlook fit for talent, right? Mm -hmm. The Lakers didn't need a 37th point guard, but they went and signed Dennis Schroeder because he's slightly better than you, you would normally get at a minimum type point guard, you know, and, and uh, there was no surprise that they were connected to Cam Reddish for the last two trade deadlines. Uh, for the same reason, right? Just, well, can we get him here with Phil Handy? And can we get those guys working out? And can we can we get something more from the from that talent than the you know Wizards or the Knicks or the the Hawks had gotten to that point? And and uh, Hachimura, like he fills he fills a need of a desperate need. They haven't had anybody with size on the wing, anybody right. with you know meaningful NBA athleticism who could you know hope to defend some of the, the league's elite wings. So they check a box there, and the thought is they're going to keep him long-term as as a 24-year-old kind of sort of prospect. 6'8", 230, like chiseled, super yeah. athletic. You're right. Like those, guys, those guys are hard to come by, and that's why you always see them kind of – like you see guys like Rui Hachimura just stick in the league forever. If, uh, the big question I wanted to ask you is, are the Lakers done before the trade deadline? I, I don't necessarily think they're going to go so far as to trade both of their first rounders. I, I do think they probably move one of those first rounders and, and they bring in uh Boyan would be my kind of prediction here. Mm. The other thing about the Lakers though, is that as, as much as we like to talk about the potential moves that they could make, right. Um, they often go, they, 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 it's, it's pretty rare that, you know, a trade that we've been talking about for a long time, a long, long time actually gets executed. So right. we've been talking about Miles Turner and Buddy Heald for what feels like 33 years. That's probably not going to happen. Uh, Buddy Heald by his, on his own, that trade was, was something that was kind of talked about quite a bit. And then Russell Westbrook happened. Uh, the Lakers had other intentions a, a couple off seasons ago when they first traded for Dennis Schroeder that came out of nowhere. So uh, the, the Lakers like to get kind of creative here uh, and, and, you know, maybe they, maybe they overthink some stuff like they did with Dennis Schroeder and as they clearly did with Russell Westbrook, but you know, those trades that we talk about a bunch don't often wind up coming to fruition, but I look LeBron's body language after last night's game or at the end of last <laughs> night's game where Russell Westbrook and Dennis Schroeder are like arguing about who was at fault for a turnover that kicked off an 8-0 run that the Clippers went on and essentially put the game out of reach. Uh, that and, and then after the game, he's asked about Rob Palenka's approach and some of the quotes about his approach to the rest of the season. And, you know, him just refusing to answer that question and refusing to kind of give anything up as far as praise or criticism here, uh, it, it's clear that as nice as Hachimura is as, as a, as a piece and, and as nice as he might be moving forward, a 24 year old lottery prospect or a gamble isn't, I think what LeBron had in mind right. for help this season. So I, I, I think they compromise and they, they wind up moving one of the picks. I want to touch on the LeBron thing there. Uh, and I'm glad you bring it up but before we do that. Is there a name that Anthony Irwin is thinking about? Well, before it was Kuz. To be honest, you know, the Lakers, uh, from from what I've been told, have been calling Washington quite a bit about Kuzma and have, like everybody else, been told that they are adamant. They are not moving him. They do not think that they, they think they'll be able to keep him in free agency. 
and they moved Rui Hachimura to kind of send a message to everybody that, no, we are going to invest in this thoroughly mediocre core of Bradley Beal, Chris Saps, Porzingis, and Kyle Kuzma. Um, but, but look, thoroughly mediocre is, is just like, that's Washington, right? That's, yeah. that's the, the, that's their kind of motto. Yeah. Uh, I so I would okay have... smoothie there once. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's just, <laughs> it, was, it was very mediocre. <laughs> it's like, exactly. The, the fruit, you can still kind of tell it was frozen fruit. It wasn't fresh fruit. Like it was just, <laughs> you could, you could tell it came from a bag. It was interesting. Zach Lowe and, and Bobby Marks were kind of throwing out trade ideas and, and low when he throws out a trade idea, like it, it's usually coming from somewhere. Yes. So when he says that, like, yeah, the Lakers and the Bulls should hook up on a trade for Westbrook and the two picks for Zach Levine, that's the kind of trade that the Lakers would be interested in making. They want yeah. that third star. They want to sell those jerseys. When he said that, that kind of that that raised my eyebrow. That makes me kind of think, huh? I wonder if they wind up coming back to that as prices around the league kind of drop. Let's talk about LeBron. Um, you mentioned 46 points last night. They lose by what was only 17 points, I think, to the Clippers, but it felt like a bajillion. Mm -hmm. Um, what did you make sort of of the pouting on the sideline? I get it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I understand. Uh, you know, here he is. He's 38 years old. Since he's turned 38 years old, he's averaging almost 36 points a night. Unbelievable. <laughs> Unreal. <laughs> like, it's just, it's incredible. And for like LeBron in that moment, I think like Paul George said it after the game. And I found this really interesting because LeBron, I think made six threes in last night's game. He was shooting the ball. Well, the ball was going through the rim clean too. He looked really confident on all of his shots. And he had that kind of look that, you know, people in Miami remember that game yes. six against Boston, where he looked like a homicidal maniac um, <laughs> as he was just wasn't talking to anybody he he just had had he just looked like he was getting ready to murder people. Paul George recognized it. The Lakers had all the momentum in the world, and then Russell Westbrook throws that stupid pass and then the eight zero run and and like you said, seventeen point loss. And right. and I think LeBron is just he's invested so much into this season, and to not have that reciprocated by the front office, I think is really wearing on him. You know, he, yeah. he's. He usually handles press conferences really well, even after losses. But last night he was like snapping at reporters. And I, again, I totally get it. And I think Russell Westbrook is a really frustrating teammate. You know, he might be, you know, he, you don't really hear very, very many teammates say he was terrible and he was selfish and all of this, but he also just doesn't seem to grasp moments. Like he just, he doesn't seem to understand what a moment calls for. And, and um, you know, I think for LeBron, he's just kind of seeing his, his fight against mortality might be, kind of fruitless at this point i know that everybody talks about lebron james and the lakers nationally all the time and my biggest thing and everybody's we talk about lebron too much like if you're not a lakers fan you don't care like we're talking about them too much and my whole thing this whole time has been i don't know i, I don't know that there's a too much for this this is no. arguably the greatest player of all time playing out of his mind you mentioned the numbers 36 points per game since his birthday it's just this is wild stuff um he's yeah. about to be the leading scorer in nba history and yet he's just sort of twirling away it's like LeBron and a bunch of Troy Browns and Wenyan Gabriels. And you're like, really? Like, this right. is what you're going to do. And, and and we're talking about whether or not you're going to trade these picks. We'll get to all that here, too, in a second. But in terms of the, the scoring record, I, I, I want to, before we move off of LeBron, how much, it, that to me feels like a national story, and it ought to be, right? Leading mm -hmm. scorer in NBA history. I, I'm, I'm curious. I, I have no, I have no finger on the pulse on this. Like, how much do Lakers fans care about LeBron kind of hitting this scoring record while he's in a Lakers uniform? I don't know. I don't think it really moves the needle much. It's yeah. kind of weird that it doesn't. I if look, if he was going to break this record and he was playing on a team that was like legitimately competing for a title and the 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 front office made the the trade for, you know, the two picks and they brought in help and this was a team that looked like it could compete against anybody. I think I think fans would care more. Yeah, I I think but what comes first here for the Lakers because he's not a lo a lifelong Laker um that it's just it's not something that they're really getting behind and and it's really too bad too because the way that he's doing it uh it's it's efficient this isn't like you know kobe at the end of his career right. where he was just a chucker and you know it made sense he's supposed to kill he's an injury and he was also on terrible teams byron scott was his head coach and that's not going to help anybody but like 
with with this situation here, it's just kind of sad to watch somebody make legitimate history and do so efficiently and do so in an impactful way that has kept the, the Lakers. I think the Lakers are 10 and nine since Anthony Davis went down. If I would, if you would have told me that I would have called you insane that they'd be able to keep right. things afloat without AD. So clearly LeBron is still not just an incredible scorer, but just an overall great player, a top five to 10 player, uh, probably 10 top 10 player in the league right now. And, and to see that just kind of, go out with a fart noise as, as he gets this close to breaking a previously unheard of record uh, is it's, it is kind of sad. So the topic about the two unprotected picks that they have to deal is, is, is out. You've got kind of two trains of thought, right? Why would you trade these picks when you're not really guaranteed of a title? If it's not bringing you something back that can get you there. The other train of thought is you've got LeBron, you owe it to him, deal the picks, get what you can for him. I think I fall somewhere in the middle where it's like, I don't know, is there a trade that ever existed that guaranteed you a title? I, I don't know that that trade has ever existed. And then the other <laughs> thing, too. Like signing Kevin Durant, and right. that's it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was like, oh, okay, the Warriors. All right, now we know. All right, very good. And, and But uh, outside of that, right, it's like – so I get it. I get that if they're going to take this down to the very end of the deadline and really just do your due diligence and try to figure out what the best is that you can get for these two picks, that I get. What I can't, what I don't get is, to your point, LeBron's still a top ten guy. He, if he's your best player, you still have a chance to win a championship. Mm -hmm. You just got to put a team Especially around with him. AD. <laughs> and you think about somebody like Daryl Morey and guys like this who are so analytically think all this stuff. They say, hey, if you got an X percent chance of winning the championship, you got to do it. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's open enough in the West. Like, I look, I do agree that there's not really a trade out there for the Lakers that are just going to make them favorites in the Western Conference. But if you've got LeBron, if you can capture a healthy Anthony Davis for a postseason run like they did in the bubble, and you got a third guy and you can make the right move or whatever it is with these picks, you've got a chance. And I think if you've got a chance, you sort of owe it to them. Where do you come down on the picks? I agree. I, I agree, and I take it a step further. This isn't even like a Lakers thing. Like the, 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 the lesson of the last dance, which we were all captivated by in the middle of the mm -hmm. pandemic, was how ridiculous it was that the Chicago Bulls, who, by the way, haven't sniffed that same kind of relevance since Michael Jordan, were willing to end Michael Jordan's era a year or a few early because he, you know, because Jerry Krause said so. You know, to a certain extent, you do have the 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 egos that are involved with that level of winning. But the Lakers won one championship, and they won one championship in kind of a fluky year. And I'm not here to say that, like, the bubble championship doesn't mean anything or whatever, but the Lakers have basically told us that. They ripped apart that team, and they have ran in the opposite direction of the equation that led to that championship. So it isn't just a Lakers thing. I think it is, like, a sports thing. Guys like LeBron, guys like Steph, these, these, you know, the Lakers felt this way about Kobe, which is insane that they've just like changed their mind here. But those guys who were that important to the, to the game, if they're still capable of vying for a championship, yeah. th that, that organization that has them in, in it owes it to all of us sports fans to try to get them one. So yep. picks for eighth graders right now, I just can't seem to care about. I also think that we, we keep talking about it, and then I get it. Like, you owe it to LeBron. You owe it to LeBron because he is so great. You kind of just owe it to being a sports team. Like, yeah. you have one of the better players in the league. Therefore, you have a chance. That's just how the NBA has worked and always has mm -hmm. worked. And so you look at the other teams that have one of these top 10 guys. None of them, again, not to pick on Wenyan Gabriel, but none of them are surrounding their best player with, like, 14 Wenyan Gabriels. Yeah. They're, they're, they're going out and they're doing stuff. And, and I just think that that's what you do. Like, you have – like you did all the LeBron stuff. You did the Anthony Davis trade. I don't really care about those picks. And you're the Lakers too. Like, and there's other idea that they're mortgaging the future. They're not because of the Stephanie rule. They still have picks in between the, they still have the 2028 pick. If they trade 2027 and 2029, it's not like they're without draft picks. I would argue that they're actually mortgaging their future by being focused on that future. Right. Mm -hmm. Because the Lakers operate by bringing in stars. That's their focus. The, yes. They got LeBron despite being, you know, seven years of ineptitude under, under Jim Buss, right? And, and, and it's kind of interesting. You're watching, I think, Jeannie Buss uh, fool herself into thinking that LeBron's will just show up. But if you waste this portion of LeBron's career, you know, because of his, his ties to Clutch, Clutch isn't going anywhere. Stars are going to want to sign with Clutch for, for the foreseeable future too. 
you're going to, you're going to completely burn that bridge with that organization. You already don't get along with CAA. They're the Knicks over there. Right. So, so the, this idea that the Lakers, you know, they're, they're holding tight to these picks because in 27 and 29, those, those things are going to be invaluable, but I would actually argue that holding on to them and prioritizing them, prioritizing a future without LeBron over the current, the now with LeBron yeah. is about as dumb a thing as you could possibly do organizationally. We love the national holiday calendar around here. <laughs> and this week is Irish coffee day. Oh, yes. Love um, good Irish coffee. Great. So you're the perfect person to talk to. Um, what is the latest you could be drinking an Irish coffee in public and it not be weird? Well, the nice thing about coffee is nobody ever really knows for sure you're drinking it. Like, like, like Irish coffee. Like Irish coffee, it comes in a mug. So like you could just be kind of sitting there and people walk by and, oh, he's just having a cup of coffee. You know, so uh, that's that kind of helps. Right. Uh, I will say, though, like if it's known that you're drinking an Irish coffee for some reason, if it's, you know, when you when you when you get it at the, the, the bar or whatever and people say like, all right, Anthony, your Irish coffee is ready. And it's like one thirty in the afternoon. That's late. That's too late. It's got to be a.m. time. I, really? I, I think you oh, yeah. get well, one thirty in the afternoon. No, no, because, well, this is where it's kind of funny, though, because I, I'm an. Early, or, you know, a morning Irish coffee drinker. Okay. And then it's actually really nice at the end of the night, you know, after a meal, you know, you, you, right. you, you, you've had a nice big steak well, and you teeth. want like a dessert cocktail. Irish right. coffee is delightful right there. You're about to head out into the cooler night. You know, that's a, that's a, that's a great call there. But yeah, in the middle of the afternoon, that's a tough one to get away with. <laughs> that, what if that's like a Sunday brunch? Cause you know how people, They'll, they'll, yeah. they'll sleep in, and sometimes that brunch is like, are you sure this is brunch? This feels a little bit more like lunchtime, <laughs> but it's brunch. So yeah. if you've got a waffle, you can have an Irish coffee, even if it's like 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I guess, but there, like, you have better options. They're, like, if you're if you're at a brunch, you have mimosas at your disposal. Yes. You have sangrias at your disposal. You have, yeah, yeah any number of things that, that aren't going to weigh you down like a, an Irish coffee. Because a good Irish coffee is heavy. Like that, yeah. you, you could have maybe one or two of those and, and you're ready for a nap. So the heavy cream, all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I still, I still say, you know, anytime in the AM, uh, and then anytime after that, like nine o'clock kind of rain, or, or I guess eight, eight o'clock after dinner, you could have one, but any time in between there, I, I'm not judging people can do what they want, but that's not really Irish coffee time for me. Anthony Irwin, our Lakers and Irish coffee expert. Thank you so much. Thanks for hanging out, buddy. Anytime, man. Hit me up anytime.